Well, welcome everyone who is, who is joining us on Facebook. Uh, my name is Jeremy Rutledge, and I'm the senior pastor at the Circular Congregational Church here in Charleston, South Carolina. And I'm just really happy to welcome my friend, uh, the Reverend Dr. Amy Butler, Amy, um, who's interim a senior pastor at the National City Christian Church in Washington, D.C. Um, this is part of the Reverend Dr. Amy Butler, um, Amy, um, who's interim. You hear that echo? Pastor at the mm -hmm. National City Christian Church in Washington, D.C. See if we can. Um, this is part of troubleshoot our echo. Okay, hopefully, hopefully we're a little better. Um, before I continue, I'll just say uh, we're really learning the technology, like a lot of churches uh, and perhaps other groups. Uh, all of this was new to us in March. And so uh, I'm especially grateful uh, to Catherine Cullinan and Tyler Ung for helping us navigate these platforms and everybody else for your patience and kindness as we figure this out. So um, this is uh, the beginning of what will be um, some really wonderful lectures for us tomorrow night and Thursday night. Amy will be bringing our fall lectures in theology and ethics and on those evenings, we'll have a slightly more formal presentation, and I will uh, talk a little bit about the lecture series and um, share how it came about, and then do a formal introduction of Amy, and she'll be leading us uh, in a consideration of faith and politics. Um, and we'll go into that tomorrow. I mean, I don't know if anyone's thinking about that these yeah, days. Yeah, yeah. Is anybody? Yeah, it's, just, it's, it's an obscure topic. Yeah, something we came up with, one of those oddball <laughs> things pastors like to think about that don't relate to the real world. So this is this is the less formal introduction is really all I'm trying to say. And and we thought uh, it was Amy's idea that we might just have a conversation with each other. And that could be an introduction uh, maybe to each of us and to the conversation uh, that we hope to have in a much larger way with many of you uh, over the next couple of nights. Um, so Amy, I've said a lot already, um, but let's let's kick it off. If we were um, if we were catching up, how would we do that? How would we, you know? Well, this is this is just selfish, right? Because I wanted another opportunity to hang out with my friend, um, Jeremy. You and I have uh, so many things in common that I, I think a lot of people don't don't really know. We're both Baptists. Grew up. Baptist and our paths have sort of crossed and now we're serving churches from other denominations. Um, and we have some other stuff in common too. Um, but that's always made you a very um, a dear friend and good conversation partner. So I'm glad to be able to just catch up. Yeah, me too. Me too. And it's, um, uh, yeah, for those who, who don't know, um, uh, Baptists who end up in the places that we end up tend to find each other. It's a small world that way. Uh, and some, some of us, I think, are probably tuned into this. Um, but the first, um, Amy, I didn't know about all the um, common ground we had, I think, until we met. And we met, um, for those who don't know, we met for the first time only five years ago mm -hmm. at, um, at a picnic uh, in Kailua on the windward side of Oahu. And we were there on a pre-planned trip. We were just visiting and um, had, we're having a picnic with some friends. And one of them knew that you were in town and I think knew you or some, there were some connections. And so we invited you and I think some of your family were able to come as well. And it was very uh, Hawaiian style, just everybody come to the picnic and hang out. Um, and that's the first, the first time I met you. And I didn't know uh, that you had grown up there. I actually knew your reputation as a preacher and as a kind of a formidable uh, Baptist in public life and someone I, I knew of and admired, but I didn't know, didn't know your um, backstory or your, your upbringing. So yeah, I grew up here. also on the, win the windward side of Oahu. Mm -hmm. my, my dad is a native Hawaiian activist and community organizer, and I'm the oldest of five kids, so steeped in Hawaiian culture. And um, when I went to college, I went to Baylor, as you did. And, um, you know, on, in the islands, that's, that's what the successful kids do, right? They get off the island, and they go to the mainland, and they learn how to, um, you know, 
um, interact with the respectable people. <laughs> but there's this whole back culture behind who I am and I know who you are that informs our lives and our interactions with people and our and the way we think about God too. So it's so one of the things I love about talking to you. You just understand all the things, you know. Right. And that I think part of the challenge is explaining all the things. Like, so when people ask me, uh, what does Aloha mean? Or what was it like? What were your impressions as a kid? How did that place shape you? It's really hard sometimes to put it, put it in words. But I know part of our, part of our hope is to try at least to, to convey some of that. And at that um, picnic, I remember you asked me what being a kid in Hawaii, how that shaped my life or ministry. It was just this really good question. And I had such a hard time answering it. And I think I've been thinking about it in different ways ever since. Um, and it, it was really after that question that I realized, and then I'm going to, then I'm going to put the question back on you. <laughs> um, that my earliest experiences of the world were, ex were extremely earthy. So even when I thought of God as a youngest boy, I thought of Kailua Beach, I thought of the waves, I thought of the mountains behind me, I thought of the smell of the place, which we've talked about, the smell of salt and the plumeria and guava, which was my favorite thing to eat. And um, it was very sensual, it was very natural, all these images um, of creation. I, I bonded, I think, with the physical place. Uh, and then in terms of people, um, you know, Hawaii is so so multicultural that my church was multicultural, my school was multicultural, and um, none of it was white. None of it. Yeah, was you were probably a minority. Yeah, yeah. I, think, <laughs> I feel um, like more white men need to be that. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, so my culture shock was leaving there and then going into spaces that were white, um, and not not knowing how to be in those spaces and feeling like so much was missing so much was lost and i grieved as a little boy when we moved um, because i'd never been in places well um my parents said i came home from school the first day it was a good school <laughs> right so it was all these white kids in a class and i never seen anything like that um, and i came home very upset from school and asked where everybody else was mm. And that I, I still sometimes feel like that little kid um, asking where's everybody else when I'm, when um, so many of the cultural patterns kind of, kind of shunt me off into white spaces too often. But that's, that's me. I wonder, you um, have much deeper roots there and much longer time. And I wonder how, how you feel it's shaped you or still shapes you as you kind of mm. move to the world. Yeah, I think at first I was un completely unaware of how it had shaped me. Uh, when I went to college in Texas, I arrived on campus as like, so not part of the in crowd, you know, I, I just didn't, I didn't fit in. I didn't understand what people were talking about. I, I didn't talk the way they did. And in a way, I think that was a gift because it helped me sort of find out who I am at the age that you need to start thinking about that. But I also remember going to visit a friend whose parents lived in a small town over the weekend. It was in college. And we went to the grocery store to pick up something. We were in the parking lot and someone drove by and yelled a, a racial epithet. Like just, it was like horrible. Like I never, I, I never, heard that before in real life. And, um, you know, my experience of the, the kind of race divide in America was so skewed because of growing up in Hawaii, you know, where everybody's all mixed together. And of course there's racism and it's just a different, it's not as polarized as it is on the mainland. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, what if they find out that I'm I'm part Chinese. Like what, what if the, you know, what if they find out? And I, I remember that moment and it, it just has stuck with me. Um, but I, I feel like I've had to 
run to catch up to understand the depths of what's going on. And I don't even know if I fully do. But also, I think growing up in the islands was such a gift. It has completely formed my view of God in in a way that relates to nature, as you've said. Like, if I need to connect with God, I need to be near the ocean. There's, I'll get even teary about it. Um, that's really important to me. Um, and then the, the sort of idea that when you live on an island... Your well-being is directly related to the well-being of your neighbor because you're on an island and you're all going to die if you don't take care of each other. And so even though I grew up in a very conservative evangelical setting where there were clear rules, like there was always room around the table for anybody who needed a place. I mean, there there was this sort of dissonance that... Um, I think has allowed me to land in um, in the more in the more free space of um, understanding the gospel to be very similar to what I learned growing up. Like we take care of each other. That's what we're here to do. That's an expression of God's goodness in the world uh, when we do that. Yeah. Do you do you think? Um... I mean, did you read it through a Hawaiian lens or do you hear any themes that um, kind of play off each other? Well, I, I think like you, I couldn't really articulate it because it's just built into who you are. Of course, if you're going to, to have a picnic at Kailua Beach, you invite all your friends who might know somebody who has a brother who's visiting and you bring a lot of food, you know, Um and that sort of sense of everybody is welcome. Everybody is welcome. And uh, everybody has something to contribute to the conversation and, and to the thriving of the whole, right? Um, there are a lot of problems in Hawaii, you know, um, a lot of social problems, homelessness. Of course, I can get on my high horse about colonialism and how the islands were stolen. <laughs> Um, um, but there is an underlying sense of, you know, I belong to you and you belong to me. And even if you look different, mm -hmm. we would call you a Howley, white, a white guy. Uh, you can still come to the picnic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I wanted, um, I've, I've shared this with you. I was, I didn't talk much about, um, Hawaii for a long time because I felt, like I was, I wasn't from there, even though I was born there, and that was a, that was a racial ethnic identity, you know. So, um, but it was really through returning uh, over and over and staying connected with friends, and then through a couple of Hawaiian friends who sort of blessed me and called me um, Kama Aina, like you're from the land, you're from, you get to be from here because you were. You were a little boy here and this is where where else will you be from and so um even though i was not native hawaiian i want to have um great respect for that culture and, and um that is not my own but that i've learned a great deal from um it, i needed i needed people from there to um kind of bless me to say to be able to say aloha a little more freely and to embrace that without feeling like i was um doing any harm or doing any disrespect. And, and I think that's one piece of aloha that um, probably is not very well understood outside of the islands is the depth of the reverence and respect for others and the care you would take in, um, you know, taking off your sandals is important, <laughs> you know, it's, and, and there are a lot of, um, sorry, our phone is, <laughs> is ringing. So, um, I think sometimes uh, aloha is shorthanded as a as just a greeting or a form of love or it, you, these sort of sentimental definitions, and it has many definitions or layers. But um, something about really respecting other people and really seeing them, really caring for them, and giving to them, not with the hope of return, but just because they're beautiful, just mm -hmm. because they have dignity, and and recognizing that. And um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you have a, a take on that, the respect part of it. I, um, 
It's so interesting because I, I have an experience that's sort of the other side of the coin. Um, you know, I appear in the world as a white woman, but my identity is, is, is native in, in every way. And sometimes I feel erased, you know, or like an outsider or like I don't speak the same language. Um, and, you know, I've really found my identity in, in ministry and in trying to live a life as a follower of Jesus, you know, because that corresponds with these ideas of aloha and lokahi and pono and all of those Hawaiian values that we grew up understanding, right? Well, and it's interesting, too, when we think about, I mean, a lot of times I feel like I'm actually, um, if not conservative, then in some ways traditional. So the, th <laughs> the things that um, people consider progressive, like marriage equality, for example, to me is very traditional when two people are in love and want to get married. You know, I mean, there are a lot of um, just very respectful um almost family values. I know that language has been been taken by others, um, but a lot of the things I think we're working for around here, the th things our faith compels us to work for, healthcare for, for all, um, you know, equality for women, um, an end to police yeah. brutality and racial, pro these seem very um, just ways of showing respect to people. And, and value. I think of it as like sort of an ease. The islands have an ease to them that just, you know, just naturally assumes there's room for you, there's room for me. Uh, you might be different than I am, but, you know, um, we're all here together. And I, I also think there's something about Hawaii being a, a matriarchal sort of culture. Um, uh, Hawaiian women were the ones who were at the center and um, the core of, of what uh, what it meant to build um, society. And I I heard that all the time, all the time, all the time. So you know who knows all the things that form you, but um, that's just some something about me that I never really get to talk about in a lot of depth unless I'm with you. It's cool. And probably because I never stop asking, right? And, and uh, it's, um, it's just, it's good to remember when you say that now, I also am just flooded with images of Hawaiian women in our church and Japanese women in our church and Samoan women and all these, all these women who were um, my early teachers, including my mom, um, who had the, had the great sense to just take us to Kailua Beach Park as often as possible. So that was, um, I think, I think as great a gift as anyone could give. It's a magical place. It just is. And, and if you've been there on vacation, you, I think you can understand a little bit about uh, why I would say that. Mm -hmm. And then to, to, for it to be your home is even more amazing. I'm so far away and I miss it and I can't go. I know. Uh, um, and it does, it does feel really far. When we lived in um, Houston for so long, it, it felt a little closer. You know, uh, yeah, this is real funny. close. <laughs> you, could, you could get there in one flight. And here on the East Coast, it feels, you know, we're closer to France. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it feels different. Um, and so if anyone... If anyone is tuned in from the islands, we're sending, we're sending you aloha. We, we know you're far away, but we're glad to, to see you. Um, yeah. I've, one, of, one of my great, the great joys of my life has been uh, spending a lot of time in the islands with my children. So they, you know, have a familiarity and an ownership over that identity that now as they're young adults, I'm just loving seeing that my oldest actually lives there and has for uh since he went to college there so um i think he's probably gonna stay so that yeah. brings me a lot of joy oh that's and when um i don't want to cause any pain but when was the last time you were there oh geez it's been <laughs> such a long time 
Like a year and a half now. Okay. Yeah. Um, I had a big 50th birthday trip planned for January and um, it's not going to happen. No. Well, um, Oh, I don't, I don't even know what Let's to say. Let's all that. cry. Yeah, that <laughs> yeah. just hurts. We'll just you know, think. I mean, my parents live there too. So it's mm -hmm. it's like, I can't go see, well, we're, a lot of us are dealing with that now. So um, just missing that. Right, right. Um, wow, well, it's, it's um, yeah, it is a, I don't know, we're far away, but I, I, um, I've lived my life, you know, elsewhere and had to sort of figure out at some point um, how to just carry some aloha with me wherever I went. And, um, and I, I try to do that. I know you, you do that a lot. And um, what did I say the other day? It's like our secret power. It's like our secret. Yeah. <laughs> secret <power>. Kind of <laughs> a secret, secret power or almost a secret um, language at, at some point. Um, but, and I do, the, one other thing that before we depart uh, from, the, from the islands for a minute, um, I was listening to an interview the other day. Um, it was an interview with Nainoa Thompson. And I just like to listen to him sometimes. He was the, from the Polynesian Voyaging Society and was talking about the Hokulea canoe and sailing. And, but he was really just talking about his boyhood and growing up um, and in a, place um i think he well he grew up in honolulu I, I can't remember the neighborhood um but he talked about going from one house to the other and being just welcomed in there's a place for you here this is a japanese house this is a portuguese house this is hawaiian house come on in have what we're having we'll see you tomorrow whatever and um that's the kind of experience i had we lived at, on a cul-de-sac at the end of kind of dead-ended at the top of the mountain and um everybody knew everybody Oh, yeah. And everybody, your sandals might be in front of your house or in front of the neighbor's house or wherever. And, um, but it was that feeling of kind of love, acceptance, welcome, inclusion. It was just in the water. I wonder. <laughs> I just find that. it so difficult to explain, like, uh, you know, like my, my uncle, Michael, mm -hmm. he's not really my uncle. He's sort of a second cousin, but he, and my dad grew up together in the same house, but Chinese auntie raised them because my, you know, just like all the things, but yes, the community expands, expands. Yeah. And one, and one of the first times I, I took Sarah, we were just having, spending the day at Kailua Beach just swimming and picnicking, but it was hanging out and some kids were playing with us. And they, we, they weren't our kids, you know, they were just playing and some, we were talking to their parents and, and, and when it came time for them to leave, they were, they were telling us goodbye as auntie and uncle. Uh, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So after a few hours, so that's, that's kind of the spirit of it. Um, for sure. For sure. Oh. And, and I think, you know, I, we've had such a good conversation. People who are, are watching us reminisce will know that the conversations that we're going to have over the next couple of nights will be underscored by um, some assumptions related to what we've described. At least what I will say, hopefully will. Yeah, yeah, and it's a really interesting kind of segue. I know this, this conversation is unscripted, but um, it is a segue into how um, how being from that place kind of influences your um, sense of identity as a minister or how you are a pastor. Would you, how do you, um, and even how, I don't want to get too far ahead of us, but how you feel it, um, it shapes your public voice, you know? Yeah, I think um, it's a very clear distinction between, you know, um, being an individual and being a community like those are like the the that is the great divide and when i read the biblical text i want to hear what god's voice has to say about our corporate life and i don't think that god's voice says 
um, you are completely independent and you should do whatever you can to advance your own well-being and wealth. I don't see God saying that anywhere. So to me, that means we have to start thinking really hard about how it is we live together. And um, Americans in this moment are being called upon to, to really examine ourselves um, on that point. Right, right. Do you think a, a friend of mine who is um, a member of a, a, a local First Nations group um, posted something the other day and she said uh it was kind of a shorthand but she said the 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 problem with um kind of european ethics is that they start with um what are my rights and indig a more indigenous ethic starts with what are my responsibilities and um, i've kind of butchered that but but i really felt like yeah that could be a, a christian ethic too you know that's the and I agree, I think it is an indigenous ethic. What are my responsibilities? She was talking about, um, you know, what have I learned from the generations who've come before me and what do I, what am I responsible for with my neighbors and with who's coming next, with the generations to follow. And Great. as Americans, I feel like we're really at a, a big crossroads right now. And, and that is really the question at the heart of it, you know? Um, how do we care for each other? And for us who claim to be followers of Jesus, we've had the additional complication of having Christian faith co-opted um, by political ideology. And so um, it's our job to like dig deeper and excavate what it is we really believe and then live it with a kind of courage that maybe we haven't had to employ before. You don't think we should just be polite, <laughs> right? And um, that's well, a big thing where we go. I think if anybody knows me, they will know that that's not a concern of mine. I mean, we need brave truth tellers, and telling the truth can get you in a lot of trouble. Yeah. But um, I don't want to. I I want to live a life where. I tell the truth as bravely as I can. It's hard. Right. It is, but isn't it funny how just doing it gets you into trouble? And well, <laughs> Jesus died, so let's review, you know. I remember I think it was I think it was in college when I was always arguing with other religious kids, you know, who were very conservative and I was becoming less and less so all the time. I was just um and I remember just getting grief all the time. And it just occurred to me one day as I was walking, I thought, oh, Jesus got grief from religious people all the time. <laughs> so maybe this is not so bad. Like maybe this is to be expected. And um, Religious people are really the worst we are. We are. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, our, I think our formats can be a bit different tomorrow night and uh, Thursday night. And um, I'm hoping that I can raise some ideas uh, that will help us think in different ways and we can have some really engaging conversation uh, uh, about uh, what happens when God gets political. Yeah, I think, I think we can. And um, normally, you know, what we would do is we'd all be in a a room together, like in the before times when we used to get together in rooms um, indoors, and we there would be a, a very natural flow of Q and A uh, with this one, and we'll we'll do the logistics tomorrow. Uh, we're going to do our best with Catherine and Tyler to monitor comments and questions, and then um, they'll again do their best to moderate and get get the questions to you. That'll be after our presentation. Um, and I'm just going to preemptively ask forgiveness because it's going to be like three different devices and trying to remember, you know, all the things. So no, no forgiveness needed. This is all also, this is what we're doing now. Um, and one day in the future, um, we're all hoping that we'll be together in real life. When, when that is, we don't know. Um, but we do have, we do have an ocean to offer you here. It's, 
It's different. It's, a, it's, <laughs> kind of, it's own kind of beautiful, um, but it is really beautiful and it's, it'll make you feel better. So um, one thing I wanted to just ask briefly before, it's not a brief question, but, you know, um, just because it's something I would ask if we were just sitting down for coffee um, about what you feel um, you might be learning during this time, this COVID time, which is, um, which is such a struggle, but it, there's so much to it. And I wondered maybe what you feel like you might be learning or maybe what National City is learning. And, mm -hmm. and um, I know we're, we're doing the same kind of work here, but. Well, I think the institutional church as a whole has, has been putting off asking some really hard questions um, and thinking in creative ways. Just We've just been sort of, you know, skating through what is a, a, a severe decline. And um, this is kind of like a mirror in front of our faces. Like, you know, it's time to wake up and look hard at who you are, who you've been, and who you want to be. And the question that I always think about is, um, I wonder how many communities of faith will have the courage to do that. Um, but if we emerge with some that do, I think we'll be better off actually. What are you learning? <laughs> oh, um, well, very personally, I'm learning immediately. I started to learn how much, I, I started to learn it may sound silly how much church meant to me, mm. how much it, how I knew some of how integrated it was in my identity because I've been in church my whole life and I've been a senior pastor almost 20 years. Um, but I didn't really know. I mean, I, I thought of myself as an introvert, but then I couldn't stand being without people, you yeah. know, and I, yeah. I didn't know that in, in the same way. And so um, it was also just funny because I'm such a creature of habit as a thinker and a writer. Um, and this house is always quiet and I could count on it. And then it wasn't, you know, <laughs> then everybody's working and schooling from home and everything's, you know, you change your rhythm and do things three days earlier than you used to just all that funny stuff about habits that you're not even conscious of yeah. and they become uh, calcified. And then you realize, Oh, I could change this. It's no big deal. And that, that, feels very liberating personally to realize most of this stuff doesn't matter. I could do it this way. I could do it that way. Um, what really does matter? And then letting those questions come forward. Well, you spent a lot of time doing stuff that didn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, um, and I do, I guess I do find myself hoping that we won't go right back to exactly the same because some of it really wasn't working at all. Um, okay. and some of it okay. wasn't a good use of, energy, creativity, and um, some of it I want back, you know, but I think some of it will go in really. What do you want back the most? Um, people. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, that's because to me, that is the church and um, people are the church. And, and that's been one thing I think we've learned at Circular. I've been just really amazed by the, the resilience of people and the willingness for everybody to learn new stuff all at once. Mm. And I don't know where that comes from exactly. I'm just grateful for this group of people who are just a really kind group of people who mostly get it. Well, but they could have good leadership. Could be that. I mean, but it, it also um, preceded me. Um, it, I think there's been some good leadership for a very long time. And, um, and I'm so delighted that I, I can say the same thing about National City Christian Church. What a lovely, kind congregation. Oh, well, and if I should say this because um, thankfully I'll do a lot less talking tomorrow, but um, for those at National City, oh gosh, a long time ago, I think in 1998, I, I was living um, in Northern Virginia and I came to National City every Sunday because it was it was the place I wanted to go, and um, it's a beautiful, beautiful yeah. space and beautiful community. It really was. It was so welcoming, uh, and so relevant, and so good. So I, I was especially pleased that you, 
to learn that you were there too. So, well, thanks for inviting our community. I hope some folks from National City will be joining us. Me too. Me too. And and um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to our conversations, and I'm really hoping that everybody who is tuning in. Um, will really go with us into what it means mm -hmm. to be political, not partisan, but followers of Jesus in this moment and in these times, mm -hmm. and maybe brave, creative, you know, surprising followers of Jesus. I think if, if I don't manage to say something that makes you uncomfortable or makes you question what your assumptions are, then... I won't have done my job, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try. <laughs> and and what I'll, I'll talk about this tomorrow night. But a lot of what what you'll hear from me is my own wonderings about this moment and how it fits together with our faith. So I'm just so glad to be able to um, think with a, a group of faithful people. Thank thank you so much for inviting me. Me too. Thanks, Amy. And it's it's good to catch up this way. Um, and then I think if it sounds good, we can all get a good night's rest or get 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 ourselves ready. And hopefully, um, those who are here and more can join us um, Wednesday night and Thursday night. And we will be live uh, on Facebook through live stream. And then I think we're going to try to capture these lectures, and they'll be posted to YouTube. Uh, but I think that there may be a time time delay on that. That's just a technical thing. So um, join us on Facebook Live at 7 p.m. on Wednesday and Thursday uh, and or check our YouTube channels and, and we'll just make sure that that we can share this as widely as possible. So, Thanks. Yeah. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. See you tomorrow, everyone. All right. Good night, Amy. Good night.